My name is Dale Abel. I'm a professor of medicine and chair of the Department of Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at uh, UCLA. You know, diabetes is really a very interesting thing because a lot of patients feel okay, right? right? But, but what they don't know is that inside, things are kind of not so okay. So what I like to use as the example, if you take like a cucumber that's fresh and then you put it in, in like vinegar and it pickles, mm -hmm. it may look the same, right? But when you take it out, it's like, it's not the same, right? And so in one sense, what is happening inside the body of people with diabetes is that things are kind of gradually pickling, <laughs> as they were, right? And, and so because people may feel okay now, they may not be okay um, later on. And so I'll say one more thing, which is um, sometimes when you come to a meeting like this and we are you know, talking about everything that goes wrong in diabetes, one thing that we sometimes don't often talk enough about is can we prevent it? And the answer is yes, <laughs> right? So you know, there is a big driver um, globally um, um, of diabetes that is related to um, diets, food decisions, mm -hmm. Um, obesity and overweight, lack of exercise, and all of those things are lifestyle changes that we also need to get that out to the public before diabetes occurs, or for people who have strong family histories of diabetes, that there are things that they can do when they are younger, right, to adopt practices that then would reduce the risk that they could have diabetes. Because I guess it's, it's hard to change a pickle back to a cucumber, right? right? So, so we, we would rather prevent that from happening in the first place. So first of all, if you looked at people who were most likely to die of COVID early on, there were people who were diabetic and people who were obese and insulin resistant. So what it tells us that is that those conditions actually kind of prime a level of inflammation in the whole body. Right, so that when you then add on to it the COVID, they get this big inflammatory reaction that actually makes it worse. So, so you know, there are many people now doing research to try to understand um, the interactions between diabetes and insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease and, and, and COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, it, it's the other reason why keeping up these areas of research becomes so important because we wouldn't have predicted when the pandemic started that these individuals would in fact would have been at higher risk of um, death or, or poor outcomes um, as a result of the, of the pandemic. Yeah. Both type one and type two diabetic patients do have increased risk of um, cardiovascular disease, but bear in mind that um, type two diabetes accounts for like 96 percent of all diabetes. So we're talking, you know, in terms of the, the number of people um, with diabetes, probably more than eight or 900 million people across the world, um, the majority of whom have type two diabetes, then you can see that it's really um, a big risk and a big burden for um, cardiovascular disease. So whether or not one is worse than the other doesn't really matter. Is that just that there are so many um, people with um, type two diabetes that it really is driving um, really an epidemic particularly of um, heart failure. If you look, for example, at least in the United States where I live, um, looking at like heart attacks versus heart failure over like the last 20 years. So the heart attacks have gone down, but the heart failure has not changed. And in fact, heart failure has gone up, right? And that is largely driven now by the increased amount of um, obesity, overweight, type two diabetes. So we have made some progress on the heart attack front, but we have lost some ground on the heart failure front. And so that really becomes a very important area to, to understand so that we can really prevent it. My training clinically, so I'm an MD, but I also have a PhD, is in something called endocrinology. And endocrinology is the um, medicine of hormonal problems, of which of course diabetes is a very important hormonal problem. And um, when I was a trainee, like in the last century, right, a long time ago, um, people weren't thinking a lot, where maybe the focus was on like, let's, let's lower the blood sugar, right? Um, but as we, as we did that, we, people were still dying of cardiovascular disease, right? And so that really got me thinking about what is it beyond blood sugar that is increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes? And so that was really what, um, 
was my motivation for you know moving into this area of research. Of course, as well, you know my mentors um, had kind of pieces of the puzzle, and you know I was able to kind of take the different pieces and then sort of put them together in a more coherent way to focus it specifically on cardiovascular disease. As I said earlier, I think the the challenge here is that we have many, many drugs now that we can lower blood sugar, but only a few drugs actually can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So I think that where the future is going to take us is really trying to identify um, mechanisms that will allow us to design treatments and therapies that will not only reduce the blood sugar, but also will reduce the risk of um, cardiovascular disease. So I think that is where I think we'll see a lot of activity um, going in the future. I also think that we need to have sort of better ways of predicting who is going to be at risk of having a bad outcome. Because remember, every drug has side effects, right? And so you don't necessarily want to give the drugs to everybody. You want to give the drugs to people who are at highest risk. And, and so I think understanding that is going to also be a very important um, change that we'll see in the future. So I think what I would say in terms of encouragement is that there are many, many doctors, many, many scientists who are working many, many hours to try to um, understand why diabetes increases cardiovascular disease risk, trying to create and design um, new treatments. And we believe that with this knowledge um, and this um, research, then there's a brighter future ahead in terms of having um, more effective medications, safer medications, and enabling us to be in a better position to give um, advice that, or that ultimately will lead to um, longer and better health. I oftentimes say, every day I wake up, I'm actually getting older, right? Which is true. And so, you know, what that therefore means is that I have to also focus on those who are coming behind me and to ensure that I create opportunities for the young people to learn from my experience as a scientist and as a researcher and as a, as a mentor, because at some point I'm going to have to stop doing it. But hopefully I can, you know, teach three or four other, three or four or more other people. And then, you know, I can multiply the impact and multiply the knowledge. Um, and so I think that that is really um, important. And so, you know, my word of encouragement to all the young people who are going to be watching this um, video is, um, work hard, study hard, and that there is tremendous uh, satisfaction and enjoyment in, in doing things with your life that ultimately will um, impact the lives of others. Thank you, Doctor. It's been an honor for, to interview you. So Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you.